you learn how to heal yourself. Forgiveness is not about the other person, it's about you. Because carrying resentment is a burden. To carry that resentment, to hate someone, and to despise someone, and to resent someone, to carry that is a burden because the other person may not even know that you feel like that. Or the other person may not even care that you feel like that. So they go to sleep at night and they rest easy while you carry this burden of resentment and every thought the person is occupying every thought of yours. And there's a saying that, uh, you know, don't let anyone rent space in your head for free. Don't let anyone rent any space in your head for free. Your brain, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you is precious. And every thought should be thoughts that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to allow someone to come into and interrupt those thoughts. Rent free. Living in your head rent free. You doing yourself an injustice. I'll give you a, a small story, a short story, about one of the scholars of the past. His name was Malik ibn Dinar. <laughs> دخل رجل بيت مالك بن دينار ليسرق فلم يجد شيئا من الدنيا فناداه مالك فقال يا هذا لم تجد شيئا من الدنيا أفترغب في شيء من الآخرة فقال بلى فقال فتوضع وصلي ركعتين ثم خرج معه فسئل مالك من هذا a man broke into the house of Malik ibn Dinar to steal some of his valuables from the dunya. Listen to this very, very keen and very wise and astute way of responding to someone who wronged you. Broke into his house to steal something from the dunya. And we know that the Sahaba as well as the scholars of the past, they paid. No, it put no emphasis on the dunya. It wasn't important to them, you know. Today, we use the dunya as the measuring stick to determine who Allah loves and who he doesn't love. Obviously, if you have the dunya, you're doing okay financially, you know, you have everything that the dunya can offer, then that is an indication that Allah loves you. While the other person may think that because I don't have the dunya, then that maybe that's an indication that Allah is punishing me, that Allah doesn't like me. You know, Allah is not pleased with me. And rather, it's the opposite. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, that Allah said, and this is a hadith al-Qudsi, that min ibadi, that they are from amongst my servants, those who I keep them poor, because if I was to enrich them, they wouldn't worship me. And they are from amongst my servants, those who I keep them rich, because if I was to make them poor, they wouldn't worship me. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala places you know, richness and places poverty where it is best. A lot of times the circumstances that we run away from or make dua for Allah to get us out of are the same circumstances that Allah is using to change us and to make us better human beings. Allah knows, Allah knows and you don't know. So Malik ibn Dinar, individual broke into his house to steal some of his valuables from the dunya. And he didn't find anything. He didn't find anything. So when Malik saw him looking around his house, he came out from behind him and he called him and he said, oh, such and such. He said, you didn't find anything here from the dunya. He said, but would you like something from the hereafter? I don't have anything from the dunya in my house, but I do have something to offer you from the akhirah, from the hereafter. The man, embarrassed, said, okay, okay, of course. So Malik ibn Dinar, he said, so make wudu and pray to Raqqa. He made wudu and he prayed to Raqqa. And when Malik came walking out of the house of, with the individual, they asked Malik ibn Dinar, who is he? He said, Ja'a li He came to steal, but I stole him. He came to steal, but I stole him. Meaning, he came in my house, he broke into my house to steal something from my home. But I ended up winning and stealing his heart because he had no idea that I was going to respond to him the way that I did. And as a result of that, I stole his soul, I stole his spirit. And I gave him life by teaching him to pray and to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness.
One more example of this, and this is to show you that no matter how wrong, so, and I mean, if you look at it today, if someone was to, we were catching, we had a store or something, and we caught someone breaking into our store, the first thing we would do is either, you know, charge him with a bat or, you know, a weapon and, you know, try to harm the person for stealing something from our dunya because it's so important to us, you know? And that's just the natural response to someone who is not religiously conscious, spiritually conscious. A person who does not care about the dunya, it's not important. You see people today, they wash their cars two, three, four times within a week because it's so important to them. The smallest little scratch on their car, they, you know, they're ready to turn the dunya upside down because it's, it's so important to them. But the normal response today would be to catch someone breaking into your property and, and call the police or to do some physical harm to them yourselves. And that just shows you, you know, your perception about the materialistic values that you, valuables that you have. Another example is during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was a very famous story called Qisatul Ifq, the story of the lie that was told on Aisha, where some of the hypocrites, they forged this lie about Aisha being an adulteress. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, mentions this story in Surah to Noor, Surah number 24 in the Quran. This particular incident sent the community of the Prophet ﷺ in turmoil. Even him himself, ﷺ, revelation stopped for 40 days. And he never spoke a word in defense of his wife, although he knew that she was free from the accusations that they were making against her. During this ordeal, there was a companion from the Prophet Sallallahu companions who fell into this, right? Fell into this. His name was Mistah, and he was the cousin of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq Mistah, he began to spread these accusations about Aisha. You know, unbeknownst to him, you know, not really knowing that, you know, but just falling victim to spreading riba in the meanwhile. And as the Prophet said, and you that is sufficient for a person to be considered a liar that he narrates everything that he hears without verifying anything. You just narrate. And this is, you know, he didn't intentionally, obviously, if he was one of the companions of the Prophet, he didn't obviously intentionally go out to create mischief and to slander Aisha. He was just a, a willing, you know, unwilling participant, if you could. All right, um, just narrating, you know, carrying the tales that, you know, this individual Mista, the cousin of Abu Bakr who Abu Bakr used to give him sadaqa, used to give him financial assistance. He was from the Muhajirin. He migrated from Mecca to Medina, and he didn't have anything. Abu Bakr we know he was pretty wealthy throughout his life, and every time he would give away his dunya, Allah would give it right back to him. And he used to give Mista uh, sadaqa. When he found out that Mustah was involved in this accusation about his daughter, he said, I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah, I will never give you another dime of assistance for slandering my daughter. You know, he was obviously affected. You found out this individual, your own cousin, someone that you are financially helping out, and he turns around and he's wronging your family. Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, لا أنفعك نافعة أبدا. I will never give you another dime of assistance. And Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed a verse in that surah, where Allah subhanahu wa taala says, ولا يأتي أول الفضل منكم وسعتي أي. That do not let those from amongst you who have been given ample means, all right, well fall. And those of you who are influ influential in the community, do not take an oath to assist someone that wronged you. Do, do you not wish that Allah would forgive you? Pardon and overlook and forgive. Wouldn't you want Allah to pardon you and forgive you and overlook? Indeed Allah is the all-forgiving, most merciful. And Abu Bakr who said, Bala ya Rabbi, inna nuhibbu an taqfir lana. He said, yes, of course, oh my Lord, I would love for you to forgive me. And so he went back and he apologized to Mistah and he began to give him salakah again. 
My point is that no matter how much a person wrongs you, it is a challenge for you to challenge your nefs, your desires, because the nefs, it wants its hawk. It's, it's a form of insecurity, but nonetheless, it is human nature for the nefs to want what, it's, what, what belongs to him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran about divorce, that you know, they could repair or they can reconcile between them. He said, but every soul covets or desires what, is it, what belongs to it. And this is why people are not able to repair or reconcile their marriages because everyone wants their haq and no one wants to give up what is theirs for the greater good of the situation. You know? and, and that's the problem, that's human nature. So sometimes we have to put our desires to the side and to challenge ourselves to do what the Qur'an commanded us to do. And that is to pardon and to overlook, as Allah says to Abu Bakr That verse was revealed about Abu Bakr. فَلِيَعْفُوا وَلِيَسْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Pardon and overlook, forgive. Wouldn't you want Allah to forgive you? So we can also see the connection between, you know, asking Allah forgiveness and then being also forgiving towards the creation. Because how could you ask Allah to forgive you and then you don't forgive other people? It doesn't work like that. That quality of forgiveness is reciprocal. If you ask Allah for it, then you are obligated. By default, you are obligated to give it to other people. How could you possibly raise your hand and say, oh Allah, forgive me, but then you don't forgive anybody else? It doesn't work like that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. If you ask Allah for forgiveness, then you are obligated to forgive other people. And it's not the other way around, because then you end up looking like the person who said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, Allahumma arhamni wa Muhammad wa la tarham ma'ana. He said, Oh Allah, forgive me and Muhammad and don't forgive anybody else. Right? It's like we want forgiveness for ourselves and, and nobody. God bless America and nobody else. Right? That's, that's the mentality, that we want it only for ourselves and not for anybody else. We ask Allah, oh Allah, forgive me, but then we don't forgive anybody else. It doesn't work like that. If you ask Allah for mercy, then you should be merciful to other people. If you ask Allah for forgiveness, then you should be forgiving for up to other people. You can't ask Allah for mercy and then you are merciless to the creation. As the Prophet said, Ar-Rahimuna, yarhamahum ar-Rahman, irham man fil ar, yarhamakum man fil salah. Those who are merciful, the most merciful will have mercy on them. Be merciful to those that are on the earth, and the one that is above the heavens will show mercy to you. You see the connection here again, even with the quality of mercy. It doesn't work like that. Be merciful to those that are on the earth, and the one that is above the heavens will be merciful to you. But you can't ask Allah for mercy and then turn around and be merciless towards his creation. Muslim or not Muslim, it doesn't matter. Because sometimes we think that Muslims have this virtue over non-Muslims, and it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter. We are human beings uh, uh, of the same ilk. It doesn't matter whether Muslim or not Muslim. You know, we, we have to get out of this mentality that, you know, I'm going to be more merciful because he's Muslim. You know, and the non-Muslim, he gets no mercy because he's a non-Muslim. How do you expect the person to come to Islam? Uh, sometimes the Prophet Wasallam, when he would distribute the war, spoils of war, he would give those who were new shahadas more than he would give those who were closer to him and dear to him. Because he was trying to text it, he was trying to win their hearts. How do you expect to win the person's heart? Sometimes you might have to put your brother Muslim to the side to, you know, win somebody else's heart. You know, and this is what the Prophet Sallallahu was doing with you know, Ibn Umm um, um, Maktoum when he was giving the non-Muslim da'wah and Ibn Umm um Maktoum came to ask him about Islam and he frowned at him and kept giving da'wah trying to, because that was his, you know, that was his plight to try to win the hearts of the people. And Allah scolded him about that in that surah, Abasa wa Tawalla. Uh, but the point that I'm making is that if we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, then we have to be an embodiment of that same quality that we ask Allah for. We have to be an embodiment of that towards the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala a'alamu sallallahu wa ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam ataskim wa kithira wa akhiru da'wana. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.